Ground forces are reporting the threats been neutralized. India and America have a very strong cooperation in civil space. India's first rocket, Nike Apache, decades ago, was an American rocket which was launched from Thumba. There was a lull. But again, India and America are back on track in cooperating in space. The world's single most civilian Earth imaging satellite, the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar, is ready to be launched very soon on an Indian rocket, a jointly made satellite between NASA and ISRO. An Indian astronaut is already training in America to go to the International Space Station on a NASA ISRO joint mission. One area where India and America have lagged behind is in defense space cooperation. But now, with President-elect Donald Trump, the opportunities between India and America to cooperate are going to only increase, is what experts tell me. I have with me Major General Brian Gibson. He is the head of planning and strategy for the U.S. Space Command. India doesn't have a space command, only a defense space agency. But India has over 50 satellites. But more importantly, India and America have a common adversary in China, which both democracies need to know how to contain. Thanks a lot for speaking to me, General Gibson. Where is India and America headed in defense space cooperation? Well, first, Namaskar. Thank you for having me. And um, it's, it's amazing to be doing this interview here in Delhi. My first visit personally, but professionally on behalf of the United States military, United States Space Command. It's, a, it's been an honor to be here over the past several days. This is, um, this is perhaps the, the first of many visits, not only from me, but others, that uh, will seek to deepen this collaboration. As you said earlier, we have a long history um, of defense between us. In fact, I'm a career Air and Army Air Missile Defender, and you mentioned a missile that in America, the Nike, uh, is one of the precursors to weapon systems that I served yes. on as well. Um, but but our, other than our shared history, you highlighted appropriately, I think, um, several things. One, the world as we know it will not go backwards likely given our race to space. My words. Um, and that's on the civilian side. That's on the commercial side. That's on the defense side. You know, many people have said that from a United States perspective, the first space war, the first great space war was in 1991 from the Gulf War because of the precision navigation and timing capabilities that we enjoyed during that time frame. Um, we have at the national level uh, not only had a fascination, but direction to go explore, to, to pursue the benefits of space for mankind for sure for science, for education, but also for, for reasons of security. The stand-up of our command, again, it's the second time we've had a United States Space Command in our military. Five years ago, um, highlights the importance that our country has put on um, the military aspects of ensuring space remains secure and safe and sustainable. So. I suspect, just like we have for the past 60, 70, 80 years, we will continue um, to, to our inside of the United States and hopefully with like-minded partners to continue a journey collaboratively to deepen relationships, not only between commercial and civilian agencies like NASA and ISRO, but between folks like the Defense Space Agency and United States elements to like the United States Space Command. 
This week, I've had fruitful discussions with um, many military members to include at the Defense Space Agency, as well as I've listened and heard from a range of leaders from, from India. And what I'll take back to, to my leadership and to others is that, at least to me, I'm sure to others, it is evident your journey is well on its way for space. And um, it's- It began uh, jointly with America. Which, which began jointly with America. But it's also evident that there's a military aspect to that journey, just like in our country. We face, uh, we face collectively a range of threats around the globe, and those threats no longer just stay on Earth. They are enabled at times from space, and they are perhaps from space. So have we entered the era of Star Wars? Um, I'll leave that to others to characterize whether that's true. But regardless of what you call it, there are many nations around the globe who are seeking to place military capabilities in space. China, as an example, has been on a breathtaking pace. Not my words, words of others. My boss, General Whiting, he uses those words at times and others to describe just over the last several years how quickly the, um, the People's Republic of China has developed and fielded a range of on-orbit and terrestrial-based space capabilities, things meant to jam, things meant to obscure, things meant to destroy and to defeat. Um, so that concerns us. It sounds to me it concerns India as well and a range of others. So China isn't alone then. Russia, in support of their military operations in Ukraine, are using many, many space-based capabilities to enable their military operations. And there are plenty of other examples, uh, I believe, that are around the globe. So to answer your question, are we at Star Wars? I don't know, but I know this. But would the future wars not just be on land and air, but also be in space? Uh, I think there is potential wherever humans are involved, regardless of the domain. Um, for conflict to potentially occur. And it's up to all of us to try and prevent that from happening. Conflict isn't, um, isn't um, an inevitable thing in space, just like it's not inevitable in other domains. But in the past, we collectively would have said, it's not, it is inevitable. We can't potentially see that. Technology has opened up a whole range of possibilities for good and hopefully not for ill. But it is a responsibility of us, it's a responsibility of like-minded nations to provide for the security and safety of our populace, to provide a, a safe and secure and sustainable domain for the betterment of all, and to do it in an international framework with partners. Do you think one asset which people speak about in, in space is the use of anti-satellite weapons. America has used it. India has also tested it. China has the capability. Russia has the capability. Do you think in future, anti-satellite weapons could play a role in wars? Um, I think if they weren't here today, the answer to that would be no. It's just not from the United States perspective. You alluded to others. What's important though is, is that Short of conflict and crisis, regardless of what capabilities countries developed, is the responsible use of those. We in the United States have committed at the national level to not continue testing direct ascent anti-satellite weapons. We also equally are, remain um, incredibly committed to not allowing and not ourselves placing nuclear weapons in space are weapons of mass destruction. Um, that would be to the, that would be so destructive, but it would be indiscriminately potentially destructive to all. So 
regardless of the type of weapons that all mankind can, can develop, it's the responsible use of those short of conflict and then establishing an international basis of norms of behavior for us to collectively agree to. One of India's requirements, which was not met by America during the Kargil conflict was access to quality GPS, the strategic component of GPS. You had discussions with the Defense Space Agency. You met many uniformed folks. You're taking the discussion forward. India already has its own regional navigation system. Can the two navigation systems be intermeshed so that you can have forces having used them when required? Uh, really good question. I, uh, um, who knows? Uh, but what I do know is this, is that whether it's GPS and, and precision navigation and timing, or whether it's tanks on the ground, or ships at sea, or airplanes in the air, Regardless, we always seek, from a military perspective, to have as bestly interoperable solutions as we can. And that's important. Interoperable doesn't mean that they're fully integrated. As an example, in America, perhaps maybe in India as well, we have all these different devices that have their own remote control. Absolutely. Right? And they all control an individual thing, but they all get displayed on the television. It'd be great to have a single remote that turns each of the things on and off. It allows you to still, with a single remote control, control all those other pieces and parts. Well, that's possible now today, right? Some may say that's an interoperable solution, but they're made by different companies, but they're, they're made to similar standards. It's a very simple example, and I know that. But to your question about interoperability, I think, and, and integration of those two, those two specific capabilities. Regardless if we do, if we can, if we eventually um, achieve that state, our adversaries are seeking to deny us those capabilities. So at least from the United States perspective, we remain very concerned to make sure that we have the ability to operate, continue to operate when those capabilities perhaps are not available. So, Certainly the advantages we enjoy, not just militarily, but other things because of PNT are immense. But from a security standpoint, we shouldn't take it for granted. What about imagery? Are you looking at cooperating with India on imagery? Because India has some sophisticated satellites, but America has even more sophisticated day and night vision satellites. And India would certainly want access to some of those imageries. Would America and India be willing to cooperate on that? Yeah, and it, that's up to a lot of people to say yes or no, and certainly more than just you and I. Um, today, I know this. I, I've traveled in the last five months across South America to multiple countries, across Europe to multiple countries, here to Asia, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the power of imagery and surveillance is undeniable and essential. And regardless of how many satellites that we all put up individually as nations, the more collectively we can share that information, the better off we will be individually and collectively. For example, in South America, a cost of both the West Coast and the East Coast of South America, there is a tremendous amount of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing that occurs. Many countries on the coast depend on that. India for the India Ocean area, right? Um, the Amazon in Brazil, both by climate impact and deforestation. The lungs of the world. Absolutely. The Amazon region. Seeking to understand from space imagery, important. Here, natural disasters. Nisar is going to do exactly that. That's right. I, I, was, I was in Spain last week, and um, unfortunately, and it was heartbreaking to see the, the flooding that occurred they had in southern Spain. 
more rain in a single day than a normal year. And over 200 folk personnel lost their life. Space was one of the first assets to help understand, respond, try and establish security. So to your point about not only the power of it inside of national lines, we seek to collaborate as much as we can to share data for sure, whether or not we integrate or interoperate, we'll see. Um, we've already signed agreements from the United States Space Command with three specific small startups. Yes, I was gonna to come to your startup That's collaboration. Right. Tell uh, me more. Yeah, we, we seek to share data that's not classified from commercial companies, right? Many commercial companies have satellites and they generate the ability to understand, just not for um, national reasons and many times for scientific reasons, but an image is an image. A radar picture is a radar picture. If we can share that collaboratively, we perhaps inside of our own individual nations can use that for our, what we should use it for, whatever our interests are. Are you are. excited about participating with Dhruva and with uh, the other startup which you are participating with, Digantara? Yeah, I, you know, many of the startups, especially on uh, in, in the United States as well, United States Space Command, our, our responsibility is to protect and defend and to operate, not to develop. However, we, we help define the requirements of what is necessary for, necessary for us to do our job. So the United States Space Force, along with our services, just like the services in India, have a responsibility to develop new capabilities that are necessary for the military apparatus. So um, three is just to start, I think, in my mind. No, there's a first that, one on quantum with with, with, with one of the startups where uh, compound semiconductors are gonna be. Yeah, well, our, our nation's leaders have already agreed through ISET um, to make sure that we have a broad range of potential to further develop and collaborate, perhaps share, perhaps put on contract. Um, but I know this, the direction individually inside of our nations have said space is important. We need to collaborate better and more. And we need to build out the frameworks to do so. Now, now we have President-elect Donald Trump who's gonna take office once again. And the discussion which Prime Minister Modi had in his first phone call with Donald Trump, space was on the agenda. That's what Prime Minister himself, uh, his statement says. And it was Donald Trump who gave America the space command. So do you expect uh, the Space Command to get more powers in times to come with President Donald Trump coming in? Listen, I, I won't comment on politics, either inside of India for sure, nor alone in my, my own country. And regardless of who our, our leader is, um, or leader was, we take direction from him as, or her as the commander in chief of our military. And, um, and um, I certainly expect that space will continue to play a center part of national security and international security. So it doesn't surprise me, and it's not the first between leaders of nations to have these sort of these type of discussions that they recognize, whoever they are, that space is fundamental. So. There's one aspect which many people get worried is about the generation of space debris. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something which the US Space Command worry about because you monitor it? Yeah, I think we should all be worried. Um, the fact is, is that today, on a daily basis, we monitor over 46,000 things in space. It used to be much lower. It lower. used to be much lower. It's, and that tells you a couple things. One, we're probably getting better. But two, there's a whole lot more going on than there what, what there used to be. And it may even be exponential. Um, those things range from the very small to the very big. And on, not all of those are satellites. In fact, the majority of that are not active satellites. And a lot of it is from debris. So just like the world's oceans or the world's land masses or, or air spaces, Managing the environmental conditions is a necessary part of security. 
It's no different inside the space domain. So there are, I think this is a, this is a ripe area, I know from the United States and others, it's a ripe discussion to be had to try and agree to further norms of debris management. D debris is a function that happens regardless because physics are involved and forces are involved when we launch things. Um, China recently, over the last year, launched a couple, the most recent launches that produced hundreds and thousands of pieces of debris just on launch, um, let alone if you decide to shoot a satellite from Earth. Yeah, or they shot it at a very high altitude. That's right. So um, none of us want the space domain to not be available. So we have to deal with debris management. What about the large constellations which are coming up, the low Earth constellations, especially to give internet to Earth from uh, space-based internet? Uh, India's Chandrayaan-3 launch itself was delayed because Starlink satellites were right above Shea Arikota. Do you think those large constellations are going to pose a threat? Yeah, I, I don't think they'll pose a threat. Um, but like in any other domain, traffic management is an important topic. And it's becoming more important for the space domain and just not for the United States, but for everybody. Right. So um, traffic management is something inside of the United States that we have on the civil side. We are transitioning to the Department of Commerce. It used to be all inside of the Department of Defense. Inside the Department of Defense, we will retain the military aspects of domain awareness, understanding for security reasons. But it highlights your point about uh, debris management. Uh, it, it encompasses a range of things, responsible launching activities, responsible deorbiting activities, responsible design activities for however many years you design a satellite, we design a satellite, Debris management should be one of the fundamental factors. I know for sure we are considering. So, yeah, but the world says America created the most debris in space. America should be more responsible in trying to remove it using newer technology. What do you say to that? Yeah, we are certainly committed to being um, not only for our own purpose, but others, a committed partner to managing the debris that is already up there, reducing where we can. Um, and reducing the least amount by creating new. I can't but ask you, you've been a commander for the Patriot missiles. I have. Uh, how good a missile is that? I'll leave that for others to judge because I'll have a biased opinion, but I've seen it in combat. I've seen it in peace. I've personally fired it. I've led tens of thousands of soldiers around the globe with it. And it's propagated to tens of nations who use it for themselves. I think the record speaks for itself. India and America, one friction point was when India bought the S-400 missile system from Russia. And America wanted an interoperable system. And I think, believe one of them was offered. As a Patriot commander, is there a view you have on India taking on the S-400 from Russia? You know, uh, all of our countries individually make our decisions and the interests that matter. Um, and many times those are variables that those um, at my level and below just certainly aren't aware of uh, and not part of the decision making process. I suspect it may be the same in India, but in America, um, we make a range of decisions for a range of reasons, regardless of the decision why India made the decision. Um, I think the more fundamental, important aspect of that is a recognition that you need a missile defense system. And that's because of threats, perhaps, in the near abroad. Ballistic missiles can be in north, south, east, and west. So a recognition to have your own internal defensive capability, I think, is a milestone moment. Absolutely. So where do you think our relations between India and America headed? In civilian space, we see intense cooperation. There is a great bond between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President-elect Donald Trump. Do you see a burgeoning cooperation in defense space and interoperability? I hope so. I'm optimistic. 
Um, I will do my part uh, back in the United States to carry the message back of your journey and to carry the message of opportunity between our two countries. So um, as between um, now and then, whatever then is on that journey and how we progress. But um, I certainly can see a future where um, if we don't, it's because of direction to not do so. And I don't sense that direction on either side of the Atlantic or the Pacific. Were you happy when India signed the Artemis Accord? Oh, uh, me personally, certainly, but as a country, um, that underpins the tenets of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. It is important. You know, quite frankly, NASA, in my perspective, from a United States perspective, is one of the, it's one of the greatest um, institutions for good, for to demonstrate the power of promise, the power of future, uh, the power of responsibility. So absolutely, when India signed it, it was a, uh, it was a high, high water mark. Absolutely. What a pleasure speaking to you, General Gibson, learning so much from a person who's in command at the Space Command of US and hoping to build a bridge between the world's largest democracy and the world's oldest democracy with President-elect Donald Trump in place and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who puts so much emphasis on space, I'm sure Indo-American relations will go to a new orbit. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So that was Major General Brian Gibson, Head of Planning and Strategy at the US Space Command. India still has a Defense Space Agency, hopes to have a command soon. Both the Air Force and the Army and the Navy have been wanting that asset. There is a lot of things India can learn from the American system. Indians have participated in exercises at the US Space Command. Civilian space between India and US doing well. Defense space, a lot being opened up. Hopefully, that single issue of GPS being denied during Kargil conflict is going to help both democracies learn how to be working together. In New Delhi, Pala Bagla for NDTV.